ever felt alone in your journey of faith? Have you ever doubted your calling? Have you given up hope? What do you do when life takes you down and completely diverts your path? The truth is, you're not alone. The grandstands of heaven all the way up to the clouds, the highest seats in the bleachers, are piled high with people who stood the test of time and eventually saw the faith manifested. Like an opponent would do in a natural fight, Satan may try to wrestle you, pin you down, or even try to knock you out of the race altogether. So when you have become illuminated with direction for your life, you need to know that the fight of faith is on. But if you look up into the bleachers of heaven for just a moment, you will see that they are stacked all the way to the clouds with people just like you. Just listen with the ears of faith and you will hear them saying, Go for it. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Your faith will carry you through. My name is Eunice Lindsay. I am a singer-songwriter, worship leader, videographer, photographer, and the maker of the great cloud. I grew up in a Christian-based family. From the age of one to four, my parents brought me to a Bible school where they were receiving Bible training. Since I was a child, I traveled a lot with my parents from places to places for the purpose of evangelism. My dad was a pastor. He served in the tribal ministry in Sabah, Malaysia. He went from village to village to preach and pray for the lost, sick, and the demon-possessed. I often witnessed how the name of Jesus can be so powerful to heal, drive out evil spirits and change lives. I learned from a very young age that the God whom my father served is a true and living God. At the age of 12, I was filled with the Holy Spirit and was baptized at the age of 13. I will never forget this first sermon I heard after being baptized. It was about the transformation of a butterfly and it's called metamorphosis. I was told during this period of transformation, thousands of cells were being increased in a cocoon to form the feature of a butterfly. When the time is mature, they have to experience a struggle to break through their cocoon. If we attempt to cut it open and thinking it would make it easier for it to break through, then it will cause death to the butterfly because the struggle was necessary to build up the muscle strength of the wings so that it can fly and survive on its own. I did not experience a dramatic transformation, but over the years, God had used the struggles in my journey of faith, in relationships, career, marriage, to shape me into the person He wants me to be. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God.
name is Tony Anthony, and I am an international speaker, published author, and I serve as the CEO and Director of Global Operations for the Great Commission Society. I was born in the UK to a Chinese mother and Italian father. Tragedy struck our family when I was born, as my father contracted multiple sclerosis, a severe neurological disease affecting the nervous system, and my mother suffered from postnatal depression, which caused her to reject me as a child. When I was four years old, my mother was not willing to look after me any longer, so she arranged for me to be trafficked to mainland China. I was raised in southern China for eight years by a man who I thought was my grandfather, but he was not. Every time he would speak to me, he would hit me in my head with a bamboo cane, making me bleed every day. He woke me up in the early morning by throwing water over me, and then beating me when I cried. He was a grandmaster in Kung Fu, and his aim was to raise me as a Buddhist and rigorously train me his family tradition to pass down to the next generation. He abused me so much, he treated me like an animal. I returned to my parents in the UK when I was 12 years old. My father was much worse, and my mother still rejected me. I continued training Kung Fu into my teenage years, and returned to China each year to fight in many underground tournaments. I excelled in martial arts, never losing a fight and entering the World Championships where I held the world title in my style for three years in a row. I was highly sought after for my unique fighting skill and I soon entered the security industry working in the higher echelons of close protection. I guarded several high profile clients including a Saudi Arabian ambassador, travelling regularly from North America to North Africa and the Middle East. It was at this point where I met Aya a beautiful Swedish girl studying law in London. We were in love for three years, she was the best part of my life, and I asked her to marry me. She said yes, and so we were now preparing for our wedding. A few weeks later, however, while I was working in Rome, I received tragic news that Aya had been killed in a car accident in England. The one thing that made my life worth living had been torn from my hands, and I was powerless to alter the outcome. Overnight, I became a violent and reckless man, engaging in private debt collections for my clients, violating all protocols. I got involved in major crime and monstrous violence. Finally, when I was working in Cyprus, my father asked me to help him pay for a trial medical treatment that could possibly help his condition. It cost tens of thousands of pounds. I didn't have the amount needed, but I got it for him by breaking into luxury hotels and apartments and committing a number of robberies. If anyone got in my way, I hurt them badly. Soon after I gave the money to my father, the police in Cyprus finally arrested me, and I was later sentenced to three years in Nicosia Central Prison. A barbaric and violent prison where inmates were attacked, abused and killed. Each day was a fight for survival. One day I received a letter from a stranger named Michael Wright. He told me that he saw my picture in a newspaper. Working in Cyprus as a Christian missionary, he told me he was praying for me and he offered to visit me. I was not interested, but heard in the visit room you could get Coca-Cola. This is the reason I invited him. Initially, I did not like Michael at all, but he visited me week by week and we eventually became friends. He never judged me, but loved me like a son. Michael visited me every Thursday for three years. I remember one day Michael telling me that God is real and loves me so much that a long time ago he sent his own son to the world to die on a cross to take the punishment for my sins. He told me that as Jesus was the Son of God, he was raised back to life and in so doing has overcome death and provided a way for me to be forgiven. Michael told me that if I put my faith in God, turn away from my sins and surrender my life to God, then my life would completely change, and God will set me free from the grip of sin. A Bible verse that he shared with me is from John chapter 8 verse 36 of the Son, Jesus Christ, set you free, you shall be free indeed. That same night I was in my cell staring at the cross shape that the prison bars made at their intersection. I tried to believe in God but failed miserably because I struggled as a Buddhist to understand the strange Christian belief in a God that I could not see with my eyes. I lost interest and all I really wanted was Aya. I missed her so much and felt angry that she was taken from me. 
and what my life had become. It was here that I remembered how she loved me, and yet she had never, ever seen me, as I had been blind from birth. She was very beautiful, smart and fun to be with. The only one thing is that she was blind. It struck me for the first time that if a blind girl can love someone without ever seeing them, perhaps that is how I can know God. Not by seeing him, but by using faith. I prayed to God for the first time in my life, and as I spoke out to him in the darkness of my cell, I felt guilt and shame for the first time in my life. I knew that I had to say sorry to God and ask him to help me. It was that night on the 3rd of May 1991 when I gave my life to Christ in tears. I woke up the next morning and I felt completely free. I gradually stopped swearing, smoking and hurting people, and I began to share my young faith with others. This was the beginning of my journey where I was truly set free indeed. When I was born, I was classed as a mistake by the world and my parents. I was there put up for adoption. My adoptive parents were loving during my early years. Later on, as I became a bit of a rebellious teenager, I was often told that I was not a wanted child and that they didn't have to have me. I owed them, basically. Small arguments that you remember seemed to escalate very quickly into personal insults towards me, such as giving me my birth certificate and saying, well, go and find her then or we're not your real mum and dad are we so why should we care when I did get the chance to go and do something I always went for it if I got drunk I did it in a big way when we were making swings I did that in a big way as well I made one over a railway track once and it was really good I suppose I was a bit of an adrenaline junkie I used to do a lot of free climbing on the massive sandstone cliffs in the town and I would even swim in the river where it was quite dangerous for people to go. Tina, my wife, was with me during some of this period and she knows the emotional pain that I went through with my parents and the consistent mental abuse. I did a lot of kickboxing and when I moved away from the town I lived in and I became really good. I was like a semi-professional. I did a mix of security work which looking back was just legalised vigilantes. I got very good at fighting. I knew a lot of people ranging from hitmen to hell's angels and we got on well as we had the same sort of interests like being able to hurt people. I joined the army, I went into the infantry, into the heart of the action. It did not disappoint me and I did not disappoint the army. I got trophies for things like best at PT, best combat infantryman. When I was in the light infantry, I became a sniper sniper instructor, did all of the relevant close combat infantry courses, I was an expert at surveillance and even did the close observation platoon course or COP. This is now reserved for special forces and SRR. I was one of the top snipers in the British Army and on top of all that I was still active within the regiment and their duties. I was attached to the SES and I had been in service in almost every theatre of operation the British Army had been in over the last 20 years. I've been to Northern Ireland, Bosnia, Kosovo and Iraq. In each one I was nearly always in danger. I'd done all the stuff that you think looks good on films such as I'm sailing out of helicopters, fast roping, jumping out of helicopters into the sea without a parachute. I'd been shot at, blown up, been in minefields, seen the results of ethnic cleansing, the maths graves and the evidence of the slaughter of innocent women and children. All of the action above had really taken its toll and I had PTSD but didn't really know what this was. I drank more and more over the years. Tina was always by my side praying for me. The church that Tina went to offered us a family, a free holiday. I thought I'd go, after all it was free and I didn't have to do any of the religious stuff. And the reading was from Matthew 11, verse 28. Come you who are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. And when you were ready, you laid the stone at the foot of the cross, 
and the stone represented all of your troubles. When I was ready, I was like, this is it, God, you know, if you're there, I, I need you. And I find it really difficult to lift that stone. It was stone, it was so heavy. And when I placed it at the foot of the cross, at this moment, I had a, an experience that changed me forever. And I became a, a new man and, and a new creature in Christ. And since that time, I've no longer had PTSD. Hi, my name is Beresford Brown. I'm a minister of the gospel and have been for the last 60 years. I was working in a gents outfitting shop at the time when two Christians, one Baptist and the other AFM, uh, started praying for my salvation. And uh, one day they came to me and said, look, we've got a film showing at the church. I like to go and see films. And on the film was the film of Barabbas. And at the end of the film, Barabbas knelt at the cross and said, Lord, you died there in my place. I gave my life to the Lord that night as a result of that, because I realized that he died there in my place and that I became a born again Christian. I must admit, I fought against it for quite a while. And if it hadn't been for the follow-up of many other Christians, who used to invite me along to the church and the youth ministry. Um, I don't know that I'd be here today ministering in many churches in Africa, in what was Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and also in South Africa, and also over here in England, but I'm back here because God has, I believe, called me back here. And I praise God that he has been with me and he's never left me or forsaken me in that whole time. I'm Brent Morgan and I'm Chief Executive Officer of the Leprosy Mission International. It's a Christian organization that works in 30 countries around the world to see leprosy defeated and lives transformed. I grew up in New Zealand. My parents sent my sister and myself off to Sunday school, but didn't go to church themselves except on special occasions. However, they did pray with us each night and read us stories from the Bible. This was quite a common way of bringing children up at the time, but when we got to about 10 or 11 years of age, most of the Christian influence in our home had slipped away. So I went through my teenage years living like most other young people, not doing anything too bad, by society standards. I went to university and during this time started seeing a girl who was a Christian. She invited me along to her home group a few times. I was somewhat open-minded about things of faith, but it was going to take more than an emotional experience of a church service to, to bring me to faith. Around the same time, my, my flatmate had given me a book uh, to read from a guy he worked with uh, who was a Christian. And the book was Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Tony, my flatmate, started to read it, but became frightened or challenged or, or both, so he stopped reading it and gave it to me to read. And in short, mere Christianity convicted me. I remember speaking to the pastor at my girlfriend's church and asking him if I had to give up things that were important to me, my friends, my sports, uh, all the things that I were dear to me. And he quoted me the scripture from Matthew 6.33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will give, be given to you as well. And shortly after I was in a church service and during a time of quietness between worship songs, I remember saying, God, if you're really there, you, you need to show yourself to me. I can only describe the experience that came immediately after as my eyes were closed as one of immense warmth and light. And I shared this experience with other, a few other people, including some of my skeptical friends I continued to read Mere Christianity, becoming more convicted that God was real, while at the same, same time experiencing huge turmoil and conflict within. I recognised this later as a spiritual attack. And in the end I had to make a decision that God was who he said he was and wanted me to become a follower of his, or dismiss it all and get on with my former life. And on January 1st, 1985, I chose to become a follower of the Most High God. 
My girlfriend, who took me along to church, became my wife three years later. and We've been married for 32 years. We've been blessed by three children who are now all adults. At the age of 18, after graduating from high school, I went to a Bible training camp. I left home for the first time, alone, flew to Johor, West Malaysia, and attended Bible camp for two months. After the camp, I felt led into full-time ministry in the church. I was trained in various departments, including working in a Christian bookstore, church administration, children ministry, pastoral ministry, and worship ministry. Over the years, I discovered my gift in leading worship. From a small church of 20 people, I then was led to a bigger church with members of 200 to 800 people and 1,000 to 5,000 people in special outreach events at the time. I assisted my former pastor, Pastor George, in growing the ministry for approximately eight years alongside other co-workers. I was recognized as a talented singer and anointed worship leader. The church grew, and so did the ministry. However, somehow along the way, I lost my sight of Jesus. The passion for Christ had shifted to the ministry. Even though I looked active in the church, as a matter of fact, I was drifting away from my relationship with Christ, and I didn't even realize it. Eventually, it led me into brokenness. I was married to my first husband at the age of 28, and we got divorced after seven years of marriage. We struggled in our relationship. We grew apart. Not long after divorce, I resigned from being full-time at church. After one year, I was remarried to my second husband, whom I met online. He was British, a widower with a son, and we lived together in London. After three years, we finally found a local church nearby to attend every Sunday and I was invited to join the worship team, and I did. I also attended the Bible study regularly, and through the teaching, the Lord spoke to my heart, and I started a devotional life with Jesus. I was hungry for the truth. Through studying His Word, my eyes were opened to see His mercy and grace. His truth had set me free from the hurt and the guilt of my past failures. I realized I was never being called into ministry, I was called to follow Jesus. In spite of my failure, He remains loving and faithful. Now I serve Him with a heart aiming to please Him. I started to write songs again and started to help in the worship ministry at my local church, Abbey Road Baptist Church. I even brought my husband's mother-in-law in China to Christ in 2017. The Lord has given me a new friend in the church, who later on became my prayer partner. We started the prayer group at church on Friday, and prayer has ever since become a very important part of my life. The Lord's last commands to his disciples is recorded in Mark 16, 15, where he said, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all creation. God has laid a very real and heavy burden on my heart to reach the 7.7 billion people that live on planet Earth with the gospel, and in so doing has called me to do the work of an evangelist. It is my number one priority to spread the gospel throughout the world, equip other evangelists with effective tools, and to train the body of Christ in effective evangelism. I've been privileged to lead ministries that have been very effective at reaching the lost through prayer, hard work, and a relentless gospel focus. We experience strong growth primarily due to new believers being added to the body of Christ and seeing those new converts take up Christian ministry roles. During that time, God has taught me many hard and valuable lessons that have stuck with me to this day. In the last decade or so, I have endeavoured to equip people to share the gospel. And in this time, I've engaged with thousands of leaders and preached at many churches, big and small across the world. And I've noticed a pattern in these churches. Most of them are not effectively reaching the lost with the gospel in their own communities. Sure, many of them are effective at other things. Wonderful worship, amazing teaching of God's word, taking care of the poor, supporting overseas mission work, creating opportunities for believers to use their spiritual gifts and so on. 
but most are not truly effective at reaching the lost in their own backyards. After countless conversations with church leaders and workers and first-hand observations of innumerable church services, I'm convinced there are at least seven reasons why this is the case. Firstly, they've lost their gospel urgency. Second, the leadership don't model it. Third, intercessory prayer is not a true value. Fourth, evangelism training rarely happens, if at all. Fifth, the gospel is not relentlessly given. Sixth, they've exchanged evangelism for outreach. And seventh, evangelistic storytelling is not a part of the culture. I became a, a licensed lay reader. Uh, God and my family come first in everything. And I now lead that same holiday that I went on, the one that saved me. I see life in such a different way. I'm an international evangelist with the Great Commission Society and go around different parts of the world preaching the gospel. I've been to Italy, South Africa, Poland, Armenia, and I've recently became a member of the church army and I'm moving to a community where I'm going to be to the lead evangelist. And all this will be responsible for bringing so many people to Christ. My calling is to be an evangelist. I'm fulfilling it whereby going away on mission trips where we share the gospel and see many people come to the Lord. I've also seen many people healed when we pray for people. I have a book called One Shot, One Kill, One Mission, which has my journey detailed in it. There have many been people that have been touched by my story that have come to Christ. And a lady in the church asked me if I'd come out and help her at the one place in Salisbury in an African camp basically and we used to preach under the trees every Sunday there and I didn't know the Bible but I used to open the Bible and wherever I opened it I put my hand, thumb or whatever it was on a verse and that's what I used to preach on. I believe that the Holy Spirit was there to lead and guide me because I didn't know fully the things of God. But as a result I had a calling of God on my life definitely and I thought, well, it's going to be evangelical, but mainly it was missionary and moving out into two townships afterwards with a dear brother by the name of Bosworth. He was the son of F.F. F. Bosworth who wrote the book Christ the Healer. Bob was a very good friend and he became my mentor and I grew in the Lord and the church eventually sent me to Bible school. My parents and my father were really against me in a lot of ways. But my dad, in the end, actually helped support me at Bible school, which I thought was fantastic. It was a difficult time at Bible school uh, because as a young Christian, being there and all these other people there who were probably come from Christian homes and brought up in a Christian way for many years, and I was just the new boy on the block. But eventually I finished the course, I got my diploma and, uh, and all that and went back to work in Salisbury where uh, I felt a calling to go to Fort Victoria as a pastor. And in doing so, I told the ministers that the council what I felt and they told me, well, there's already a good man there. Anyway, a couple of months later, I got a phone call from the chairman of the Ministers Fraternal saying that Fort Victoria was open, and as a result, would I like to go there? I said, yes. <laughs> That's where I feel God has called me. And for three years, I ministered the gospel in Fort Vic. I only received a salary twice, but I believe I lived better than a lot of other people who had a lot of debt on their shoulders and God provided incredibly so area but God called me I felt myself originally as an evangelist when somebody told me no God has called me as a pastor and so I have been a pastor for the last 50 years there's the time and study and everything else I've been ordained three times once in Zimbabwe, which was then Rhodesia, then in South Africa, and also in America. But I believe my greatest ordination was from God alone, 
and uh, it's amazing over these years how great God has been to me in providing my needs and undertaking for the family. Ever since I became a Christian, God has given me a burden for the poor and underprivileged. However, it was some time later before I engaged in this type of ministry. After graduating from university, I entered the corporate world and worked my way up through the ranks until finally becoming a CEO. This included time working overseas uh, in Asia and our family lived in New Delhi, India for six years. And while in India, I saw and experienced poverty for the first time. I helped a pastor friend of mine set up an NGO operating from a Sun community in New Delhi. And that organization is now thriving and running a number of schools of children um, in children's homes. And after working for 18 years in the corporate world, I had the opportunity to join a mission organization and started working for the Christian Aid and Development Agency World Vision. During this time, I traveled to some of the poorest parts of the world and experiencing poverty firsthand. After four years at World Vision, I was offered the role heading the Leprosy Mission New Zealand. Persons with leprosy are some of the most marginalized in the world. They are always at the bottom of any community of which they are a part. And leprosy is mentioned widely in the scriptures, and Jesus' ministry involved the healing of those with leprosy, like in Luke 17 and in Mark 1. The fact that leprosy is called by name in the scriptures means that it is something close to God's heart. I had the opportunity to travel widely and talking to many people affected by this ancient disease. After seven years working for the Leprosy Mission New Zealand, I was offered the role of International Director and CEO of the Leprosy Mission International based in London, United Kingdom. And that is what I'm currently doing. In this role, I'm head of the Leprosy Mission Global Fellowship, an organisation that works in 30 countries around the world. We run 16 hospitals, three research sites and 200 community projects. We employ 2,000 staff. And our vision is to see leprosy defeated and lives transformed. And what we mean by transformation is both in the physical and spiritual sense. We want to demonstrate the example of Jesus in all we do. I had the opportunity to visit many, uh, many different countries where the Leprosy Mission works and speak on behalf of my organization at the United Nations in New York and Geneva. The American theologian Frederick Buchner said the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world deep hunger meet. And I have the privilege to use my God-given experience and skills to do something that I'm passionate about and a burden that God has placed upon my heart. Two thousand eighteen was the most difficult time of my life. I remember starting the year with a new song the Lord had given me during a prayer meeting at church, titled "Praise Him." I wrote the song with the intention of giving glory to God and trusting Him with breakthroughs in my life. Three months after promoting the song on my social media, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer on first of May two thousand eighteen. It was a long, horrible eight months, and I was told by my husband not to tell anyone about his condition, not even to his son or his family members. He refused to receive any help from the hospital or medication. The only thing we could do was fast and pray, and we did. I told my mom, my pastor, and my prayer partner about his condition and asked for their prayers in private. I even started a war room in my apartment, where I could hide and pray to God for strength and healing for my husband. It was the supernatural strength from God that sustained me through all those times. Eventually, he passed away on 10th January 2019. I did not understand why, but I had a premonition. The night before he passed, I requested my prayer partner to come and pray with me by his side. After she left, I spent the whole night praying with him with scriptures in the book of Psalms. He told me to give him a hug like it was for the last time. As I was praying, I saw in my vision two angels next to his bed, and I saw Jesus reaching out to me, saying, 
everything is going to be okay. My husband went to be with the Lord the next day, and I became a widow and my stepson an orphan. On the same day, my stepson went to live with his grandmother, and since then, things have not been the same. For the next few days, I spent my time pouring out my heart to God. I asked, What is the purpose of all this? Where is the miracle promised? Did I do anything wrong? What am I to do now? In the midst of my grief, God answered as I picked up the new journal my husband bought me before he passed away. On the cover, it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And the email which I subscribed from the Father's Heart Ministry came through. The message was so on time. It says, The Father says today, Allow my voice Allow my to be the touchstone touch of, of every decision, every decision you, make. you make. Your life moves your life forward, forward in dependency on my, on my voice. Just as the Just locomotive moves forward, forward on rails and tracks and laid for me, the path is sure, the, the way is clear, is clear. there is no variance no of deviation. deviation. This, this is, is the path of progress for your life, your life. and the proceeding, the proceeding word that takes you, takes you to the highest the heart's, heart's desire, desire and greatest dream fulfilled. fulfilled. My voice my guides voice you from behind, behind and goes before you to splinter and destroy every impediment and obstacle set against you by the enemy. I am shaken, says the Father, and I'm bringing change, not to harm you, but to establish you and place your feet on firm footing for the days ahead. And so I surrendered. My heart was immediately being lifted. There was an unexplainable peace flooding in me. Just as was written, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. In the same week, I went to a prayer meeting and Sunday service, and for the next few weeks, I started to get back into worship ministry. As I surrender myself to His sovereignty, I experience more joy. Then I started to tell my testimony of how I overcame my grief. Not only that, the Lord has been faithful to fulfill His promise. Jesus is my shepherd. Regardless of not having any income or saving, He is able to provide. And even though my family were not with me at the time of my bereavement, Jesus was, and He still is. He has always been and will always be. The more I seek Him, the more I find Him and the more I love Him. He sent me a flatmate to keep me company and she has been such a blessing to me. We supported each other. I also volunteered in cleaning the church hostel every week. In return, I received love offering every month. I tried to look for a job, but it wasn't easy as I have not worked for five years. With the little income I have, I gave my tithes faithfully. I tried to live in obedience to His word every single day. Eventually, I was hired as a part-time cleaner by Elliot's at the Leprosy Mission International, and I am also a freelance videographer, photographer. Praise God! He is truly the God of widows and orphans. The more I testify, the more breakthroughs I experience. You see, the devil had intended to destroy and to shake my faith in God, but I have become even stronger and closer to God as I acknowledge His sovereignty over my life. The Bible says, We overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. He is the I Am in my life, so I have decided to make this film as a tribute to our precious Lord Jesus, Savior and Friend, the author and finisher of our faith. The most difficult time of my life was as a Christian when I had a fatal car accident where I killed a lady on a motorcycle. I did not overcome the situation and said I made every wrong choice and decision in the way I handled the whole thing. The accident was proven to be an innocent mistake, however I went to prison for lying to a policeman. You see, I became the world's worst Christian 
and I could do nothing to help myself. I was a mess and I always have been. And through a strange sequence of events during my prison sentence, I tried to hide my Christian faith from another prisoner for fear of being a bad advert for Christ. However, God used that situation to lead the very same man to Christ. And it is here that I realize that God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and more, so many more. I felt the worst and in so doing gave up. And yet God showed to me how he is the great overcomer, able to use the worst of situations for the good. It was this incident that triggered my passion and drive to devote the rest of my life to full-time Christian service as a missionary. My most difficult time was when I had PTSD and I drank more and more over the years, but that was just to get to sleep. Images would flash up in your mind's eye, piles of bodies with belongings, Bosnia being blown up and set on fire, Northern Ireland, people just trying to kidnap you in Iraq, just to name a few. The fears and nightmares would consistently be there as I couldn't sleep. I'd have a few more beers, but then when I did sleep, the nightmares would come back and I would just sit up and wait. In the mornings, I wouldn't be able to make any real clear judgments. Some things that seemed good at the time later on was just stupid. At this time I was training recruits so I was considered a role model. In effect though, on the inside I'd become a shell of a man. A lying, thieving, murdering scumbag with no real thought or care for anybody. If things could not get any worse, I'd become alcohol dependent. Just because I needed to sleep. In truth there were many days when I thought to myself, what is the point? My family would be better off without me and I may as well kill myself. Why did I need God for, right? I was hard, no one used to mess with me, and if they did, very often I would knock them out. I'd spoken to and briefed members of the government about situations on the ground, had the power of life and death over people, why would I need God? I went because the boys and Tina really needed a holiday. We went and I still felt empty inside. What on earth could these Bible bashing, flip flop wearing, bearded do good as ever teach me. Look at what I had done compared to some of these. The way I looked down upon these people was disgusting. My attitude was so bad. In fact, the first few days I think I spiralled down a bit more when I thought I was being lumped in with some people like this who needed help. After all, why would I need help, even though I was suicidal? But one evening there was a thing called reflection and I went and every, everyone that went in was given a stone and the vicar that was there, I, I forget her name, but she could make a, a pig out of a banana, which I thought was really cool. And the reading was from Matthew 11, verse 28. Come you who are heavily laden and I will give you rest. And when you were ready, you laid the stone at the foot of the cross and the stone represented all of your troubles. I just remember the Lord and his, his healing really had such an effect on me and it was just amazing. Because of uh, many situations during my life, God has given me the joy of being able to know that one can overcome through the blood of Christ and the name of the Lord. Over the past year, from July last year, I've had no less than nine operations. I have cancer in the prostate and many other things like that. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm in God's hands. I did in fact pray about it. I was offered opportunities to what to go through to cure the cancer. This was over 20 years ago. And I took the radiation road and uh, it's only started flaring up recently again and I've now just over the last year had three operations alone on the prostate cancer and also on my eyes and many other situations. It's been a very uh, busy time but one thing that has always brought me through is the Word of God and through that I've also when people say how am I 
I like to say to them, I'm blessed because I can still walk, I can still talk, and I still have the Lord in my heart and being. And I know that whatever happens, He will be with me and neither leave me nor forsake me. He's an awesome God because my God is a great provider and undertaker, and I praise God for that. So living in the Lord and seeing things happen and being able to reach out by faith to me has been a, a boon to my life it has changed me completely from what I was to what I would probably be in my grave by now or, or in jail for some of the things I might have done. But God has been there for me at all times. He's been there when I've had sickness or problems or difficulties. And even the opportunities over the last few months have been incredible where I've been able to speak to ambulance drivers, to nurses, to doctors, and many others. And even in my own room here, I had one man who was a carer came around on my first operation, and he was so ripe for salvation that I led him to the Lord right here in the front room of my house. I had a group of youngsters come around, young men, uh, young adults. Uh, there were seven of them, and they came around to sing to me and testify. And I realized in two of the testimonies, two of the lads had not made a real decision for the Lord. And uh, one had said, I was born in the church and stuff like that. And I said to them, if you were born in a garage, would that make you a car? They said, no. Anyway, I challenged them and they both also gave their lives to the Lord. So being sick doesn't mean it's a penalty for being naughty or doing something wrong. It's sometimes an opportunity to minister to people you would not be able to minister normally, or people who are neglected in ministry because of the work that they're doing in caring for others. And so they also need the gospel of redeeming grace to know the joy of so great salvation. When I was 18, my father died suddenly at a relatively young age, and I was completely devastated. Uh, my father was a good, kind uh, family man who always provided for us. He had many great qualities. At the time I was uh, in the first year of my university studies, my mother uh, remarried very quickly after my father's death, which was almost a, a bigger shock. Uh, the man my mother married was not a particularly nice guy. Uh, my brother lived overseas, my sister lived in a different city. So in a lot of ways, it really felt that I'd lost my whole family. The next four years were a bit of a blur. I explored different worldviews, chased girls, drank too much on occasions, and generally tried to enjoy myself. At times, even though I had a good group of friends, I felt quite lonely. At 22, I managed to graduate from my studies, although it did take me a year longer than I should have. I really didn't know what I was going to do. And to be honest, and looking back now, I was searching for the meaning of life and my part in it all for direction. How did I overcome it? I met a girl who took me along to her church home group and shortly thereafter encountered the living God. Being a follower of Jesus gave me direction, purpose and a heavenly father to replace the earthly father who I'd lost a few years earlier. Personally, I find myself relating to King David. We are very similar in many ways. Talent-wise, David was a worshipper, a psalmist, and a musician. So am I. Character-wise, we are both bold, passionate, strong in faith. We are warriors and a God chaser. In the experience of loss, we are very similar in how we cope emotionally and how quick we are to acknowledge God's sovereignty over the situation. David pleaded with God for his dying child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord in worship. I suppose that's why the book of Psalms written by David has such an impact on my life especially after my loss. I listened to it every night until I fell asleep. It gave me great comfort and strength and healing. 
The Bible character that I relate to most of all is the Apostle Paul. Not only because of our similar dramatic conversion and prison experiences, but also because of the type of person he was. And four points. Number one, he had a powerful passion. We read that while Paul was waiting in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. You read that in Acts chapter 17 verse 16. Of course, we're not talking about an emotion here because the greatest problem with emotions is that they change so easily. Paul had a deep passion here, and this passion was fueled by the conviction that every man, woman, boy or girl faces heaven or hell. So the challenge is what do you see when you're dropping your children off in the school playground, when you're in the office or when you're doing your shopping? What do you see when you look at people? Do you just see what they're wearing or their financial status? Or do you give any thoughts to where they're going to be spending eternity? We notice here that Paul saw that people were caught up with idolatry. As Paul moved around Athens, he wasn't impressed by the greatness and the grandeur of the Greeks. He wasn't taken aback by the amazing Acropolis or the Parthenon, the buildings considered even today to be the wonders of the world. What Paul saw was the lostness of the Athenians. And if we're going to be effective communicators of the gospel, we must have a similar powerful passion. Secondly, he engaged people on common ground. It tells us in the book of Acts that Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. We find this in Acts chapter 17 from verse 22. So we see here how Paul used what was familiar to explain the unfamiliar or the unknown. He talks about them being very religious. He talks about one specific idol they had. And then he tells them that he knows the real God. Thirdly, he kept things simple. Paul presented the gospel using three simple points. In Acts chapter 17 from verse 24, the first one is that God is the creator and owner of the universe. Secondly, God wants everyone to know him. And finally, men must repent for judgment day is coming. And you can't get simpler than that. The point is that the enemy wants you and I to think that the communication of the good news is complex and difficult. He wants you to think that you need to be an expert in Greek and Hebrew to communicate the gospel. But the truth is simple. Every person is a sinner. God loves every person. He died to pay the penalty for every person. And by repentance and faith, we can be reconciled to the God. And finally, Paul had realistic expectations. We must realise that not everyone is going to respond nicely when we present Christ. But we must continue to respond to him or her in faith and love. The verses tell us that some people sneered at Paul's message, and in the same way people may sneer at us as well. However, we must also realise that the good news of the gospel will not return void and it does change people's lives. I think that one of the people in the Bible that's really relevant for me is Job. He had so much done to him by the devil, but he was faithful with the Lord. And no matter what people said to him, he stayed faithful. And I think that sometimes that's that's so relevant today where I, I get so many people saying, oh, well, God didn't heal you. Well, well, he did. Um, so it was that same thing with Job where you get people saying that about God where actually, no, the Lord is faithful to me and, and I'm faithful to him. And, and at the time of trial, it was over. Job was just blessed with a double portion. I find there are a lot of Bible characters that I could relate, but the one I would like to be in tune with more than anything else is Jesus. He was a man when he came to the earth, he was in flesh, and he bore burdens of everybody uh, in this world on his shoulders when he died on Calvary for each and every one of us. 
And uh, uh, when I think of that, I think of how great God is that he called people like Paul, Peter, Jehoshaphat, David, and Samuel and all the others to be mighty warriors in the battle for the souls of men. I believe if I was to say I had a favorite, I think they were all my favorite. because there are so many different ministries. I like the prophetic ministry, and I'm walking in the prophetic at the moment, but it doesn't make me a prophet the same way as I like all the other areas of ministry too, and I seek to know what God is doing and be able to reach out to people. Two characters that I can relate to in the scriptures, David and Esther. David, because he was so teachable, Christians often think that when they're saved they have arrived, but in fact it's just the beginning of the journey. Being a Christian can be really difficult at times. Our journey in Christ is one of continual refinement. As a Christian I've sometimes disappointed myself. I've done things which I shouldn't have and not done things that I should have. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God, which is Romans 3.23. God's grace allows us to go back to the foot of the cross and start over again. And I can identify with David because even though he was a leader and a man after God's own heart, he made lots of mistakes and some pretty big ones at times. However, he remained teachable and was able to repent and learn from those mistakes and finish his ministry well. Esther, because she was a person of authority who did the right thing. She interceded uh, to her husband, the Persian king, Uh, on behalf of the Jewish people to prevent their annihilation at the potential risk of her own safety. God placed Esther in a position of influence and when called upon she courageously stepped up and did the right thing, as is quoted and seen in Esther 4.14. As a chief executive officer I have to make decisions all the time, decisions that are sometimes difficult and unpopular, even though they are the right thing to do. And I admire Esther because she puts her people's interests ahead of her own.